good to see everybody here today, and uh, as I said, next week's Easter, so I really encourage you to invite somebody to be here uh, as part of next week's service, and uh, I'm going to just challenge us all to just take the uh, little cards that are passed out. Also, your kids are making a little pass-out card in their classes as well that you can use, and so I encourage you to invite somebody next week. Um, Somebody once asked me, they said, do you think that I could cut this piece of paper in order to, not this actual one, but a piece of paper that, that you could fit your whole body inside of it through the paper? And, and I looked at that and I thought, there's absolutely no earthly way that that could happen. And who would agree with me that there's no way for that to happen? All right, you just can't, I mean, this could not fit that over. All right, who thinks it could happen? Well, it can't, so done. I'm done with it. No. <laughs> So maybe you've seen this before. It was mildly amusing to me, so I'll share it with you as we uh, start talking about the book of Galatians again. Um, the book of Galatians is an interesting book because Paul is, uh, had went and started these churches in Galatia, and now he is uh, writing to them because they're leaving the, the doctrine that he had once taught them, which was salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And, and so the, the book of Galatians is about... Um, telling them that they're being misled, they're following these false teachers who are going in a different direction that's actually pulling them away from what Christ did on the cross, making Christ's death on the cross of no value whatsoever. And so throughout this book, Paul's been addressing that sometimes very sternly. And, and so um, today, as we continue on looking at the, the book of Galatians, we're going to talk about how that Paul actually gets very personal with them now. He moves kind of a more legalistic, uh, or I'm sorry, legal, uh, here's the facts type approach to now he's coming at them a very personal nature, really speaking to their heartstrings. But one thing, as you look in Scripture and study Scripture, you'll see that the Jewish people, the people who were following Judaism, the Judaizers who at one time were um, followed exclusively the law in the Old Testament, now they've accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but they want to have Jesus plus all the works of the Old Testament. And so um, Paul is now going to tell them that he's going to uh, tell them it's just Jesus, Jesus alone. And so as we look in Galatians chapter, um, ch- chapter 4 today, and go ahead and turn there, 4, 8 through 20. I'm going to keep you in suspense on this, on this thing here for a second. We'll work on it in a minute. We're going to see that the Jewish people had certain expectations of what they wanted in a Messiah. They wanted a Messiah who would come and run the Romans out of the country, a Messiah who would institute the law as being the law of the land, and that Gentiles and everyone would be governed by Judaism, and they would have to obey the laws. And so you can see what a shock it was for them that Jesus came, died on a cross. They could not accept a Messiah who died, even though that there was evidence and and many eyewitnesses who saw him rise again from the dead. They couldn't accept that because it didn't fit into their box of what they thought the Messiah should be. And in fact, even today, there are groups who think this. They think that if the Jewish people, Israel, can keep the law exactly perfectly for one day or keep the the Sabbath perfectly for one day, then the Messiah would return. That's today's thinking. And so you see how that their expectations of Messiah were kind of like mine with this piece of paper that we'll work on, is they, want, they thought that there's no way that could happen. And then Jesus came, and there was a whole different way of, they had to see, you know what, God's not doing things the way that I want them to done. So chapter 4, verse 8 through 20, let's read through this. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature were not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Are you observing special days and months and seasons and years? I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead for you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even through, uh, though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel from God, as if I were Jesus, Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. 
Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? These people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. That uh, what they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided that the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. Verse 19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Let's pray and then we'll look at this text. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us life and gives us truth. God, we know that in this life we would just be wandering around without any understanding or meaning. God, but you tell us in your word that life is not about us, it's about you. And Father God, as we see in the this, in this scripture today, help us to understand that even when difficult things come into our life, God, you're working for a purpose and for a reason. God, we thank you for the truth that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think one thing that's very interesting right off the bat here is, let's remember the people of Galatia, a lot of the churches, a lot of the people who are coming to Christ into the churches, these are Gentiles, people who were saved from a pagan um, following idols. And, uh, and part of this idol worship in this pagan culture was sacrificial things, and it was also a lot of immorality, debauchery within the temples. And so Paul is writing to them, and these, a lot of these guys are Gentiles who have come into in Christ and received Christ, and they've turned their back on these pagan ways of living. But it's interesting, if you read it, verse 8 and 9, you kind of come to the conclusion, what, are they going back to their former way of living where they worship false gods? Look at this, he says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God. So he's saying, before you came to Jesus, you were slaves to these idols that you worshipped. But it, So at first reading, it might seem like he was warning the Galatians not to go back to this way of worshipping these pagan idols. And, because in verse 9 he says, do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? But let's remember, the whole purpose of this book of Galatians, he's dealing with these warnings to these Judaizers who are trying to bring them back into, you have to be circumcised in order to have a relationship with God. You have to obey these certain days and, and, and these commandments to be justified, to be declared righteous before God. And so the point has never been in this book is about going back to this pagan way of living. And so what is he saying here? I think that clearly he's saying that at the root of both this pagan lifestyle, and now this lifestyle that says you have to be enslaved to these laws in order to make God happy with you, the root of it, the foundation of it, is the same thing, which is this works-driven, self-effort way of thinking that I can earn my way to God. And we know throughout this book, Paul has said over and over again, dozens of different times in different ways, that it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And so I think what Paul is saying here is that attempting to earn one's salvation through either personal morality or through, through a religious system or being enslaved to idols that's outright paganism and, and these immoral practices, it's the same thing. It's, it's from the same mindset. So in the end, a religious person who is trying to earn God's acceptance is just as lost and enslaved as an idol worshiper, an atheist, or a non-religious person. And it's, in fact, it's more dangerous, I think, for a religious person because a religious person can think they stand on pretty good ground because they're doing good stuff. They're living a moral life. They don't cheat on their spouse. They don't go out and get, get drunk on the weekends. They don't do all these things, these lists. And so they think that they're, you know, I'm better than so-and-so. He goes to church, and look at his life. He does all those things. I don't need church. I don't need Jesus because I'm doing pretty good on my own. And so it's actually more dangerous for this person because they are putting all their stock in the moral things they do, their religious stuff. And that's a big danger for people in churches today. And many people go to church on Sunday morning and they check it off their list like, you know what, I've done my duty. Man, isn't God happy with me? And they so miss the very essence of what salvation through Christ is about. And it's about his work on the cross for us. The fact that Righteousness comes from what he did. He fulfilled the law. He paid the price. He sacrificed himself. He did what we couldn't do. And as we looked about the last few weeks, if, I hope you were here or went back and watched it if you weren't, is that Jesus fulfilled the law, and the law shows us you can't live holy. You can't live righteous. And that's why we need a Savior. And, and you know, just think about my own, in my own family, my grandfather. 
he, um, every Sunday, he went to church. In fact, um, he and my grandmother, they lived down this dirt, dirt road way back in the hills of West Virginia, okay? And, like, where they went to church, they would probably consider that the big city because that, that was, like, out of, like, where they lived. But, I mean, it was still in the middle of nowhere by our standards, okay? And, and so they drove down this dirt road to this, this two-lane road and then pulled into this church. And week after week, Sunday after Sunday, they went there. In fact, my grandfather took great pride in the church and maybe some of the denominations at that time did this. They would get these pens, they would get, and then every year that you had uh, ex- excellent attendance, meaning that you could only miss like two Sunday schools, you would get another pen for every year. And he took great pride in bringing it out and showing us this long uh, badge of honor that he had of all these faithful attendance to Sunday school that he had, had done over the years. But my grandfather, by his own admission, was not a Christian. He just thought that, you know what, I'm earning you know, God or earning the, the right to one day go to heaven when I die or something. I don't really understand his thought process because he's a very hard man, that generation, and he, and he didn't show his emotions. But what's amazing, I remember as a kid, just, you know, every night my brothers and I would pray for my grandfather. And my grandfather, when he was up near 70, he, um, this was huge for him, he came forward in a service and he gave his life to Christ and put his life, gave his life to Christ and trusted Christ as his Savior. But all those years, he was thinking, you know what, I'm doing something to earn it. And praise God that he came to the realization that he couldn't before the end of his life. And so most of us, we know, we, you've heard it said if you've been here even a few weeks in Galatians, that you can't earn your salvation. You can't do enough. But what do we do? How does that same mindset slip in with us? I think it's even though we know we're not saved by our works, we often find more satisfaction in our works and our achievements than we do in our relationship with God. And even in good things and moral things and Christian things, that we hang our hat on the things that we do or don't do, the things we say or don't say, the things that we drink or don't drink, and we think that's where we find our morality. And we find our stock in those things rather than Jesus. So I think we have to continually ask ourselves, is my heart resting most regularly and most fully on what God has done or what I've done and what I've, I've achieved. Am I resting on my achievements or what Jesus did for me? We have to ask ourselves that often. Because if anything, this mindset that says it's about what I do is so dangerous. And it's, it's almost, for, for somebody who's never put their faith in Christ, it's way more dangerous than just outright saying, I don't believe in a God. Because these people think they're getting some kind of moral merit badge over what they're doing. So an irreligious person knows that he's far away from God, but a religious, quote-unquote, righteous person, they don't know they're far from God. They think they're doing what's right. Verse 9, again, but now that you know that you know God, or rather known by God, how is it that you're turning back to these weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? So he says, why would you want to go back into slavery after everything you've experienced? You've experienced, we talked about three or four weeks ago, the Holy Spirit coming into your life, and he's saying, verse 10, he's saying, now you're falling back and these Judaizers are pushing back into observing these special days and these months and these seasons and these years. And Paul says, I fear for you. Verse 11, he says, I fear for you because you think that you're earning credit with God and you're finding righteousness and you're ignoring Jesus. You're pushing Jesus to the margins and you're making these religious practices the main thing. And I'm sure Paul told them the same thing he told the, the church at Colossae In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, he said there, he said, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So he says, these Old Testament commands and days and special months and these ceremonial things that we find in the Old Testament. These things were all just a shadow pointing to Jesus. And you're making the shadow the main thing, not the main thing the main thing. He says, get back to the main thing. And he says, I fear, verse 11, I fear for you that somehow I wasted my effort on you. He says, I presented you to the true gospel. And he said, I pleaded with you to turn from these idols and turn to Jesus. And you did that, but now you're just falling back into the same slavery mindset that you have to do these things and keep 
these special days in order for God to be pleased with you. And you annul, you, you just eliminate the need for Jesus and you put yourself back into bondage. And he says, I'm astonished. It's incomprehensible for Paul that they could do this. And then look at verse 9 again. He says, I love this. He says, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how are you turning back? And right in that verse right there, you have so rich theology that exists there that says, you know what? More importantly than knowing God is that God knows you. That's what he's saying to them. So he's saying, God knows you. He knows you're his child. And so these people are not losing their salvation because if God knows you, that matters much more than you knowing God. And Romans 8 talks to us about how that God, who, those who come to Christ and truly put their faith in Christ, that God will finish the process and God will one day glorify them. And so God's chosen people, God's elect is what Paul refers to them in Romans 8. Those people who truly know Jesus as their Savior, those people don't lose their salvation. They don't wander off and don't return. In fact, the way that we've referred to it, and maybe your background refers to it as the perseverance of the saints. And so basically what that says is a true believer, a true, somebody who truly puts their faith in Christ, they will stick with it till the end. They won't turn away and, and abandon the faith. If you abandon the faith, that's a sign that you were never truly God's child in the first place. In fact, we can cite so many verses that talk about the fact that if somebody can just live like the devil and claim they're a Christian, that they're not genuine, they're not real. Look at, uh, I, I put some up on the screen. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Without holiness, we will not see the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 10 those marked by patterns of willful sin and disobedience will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then Colossians 1, and 23 tells us that God will present us before um, himself holy and blameless if we continue in the faith and if we're not moved away from the hope of the gospel. And we cannot ignore these warnings. We can't live like the devil and expect to meet God. And it's very clear in Scripture. And this is not because God demands a checklist of holiness points, and we've talked a great deal about that. We know that's not the case. But the grace that grants us faith will inevitably be a grace that causes us to change and keeps us in the love of God. Let me say that again because that's an important statement. I'll see if I can spit it out here. The grace that grants us faith, that gives us faith, will inevitably be, invariably be, the grace that causes us to change and keeps us in the love of God. And so you can't ignore the second part of that. You've got to see both parts together. The grace that draws us is the same grace that keeps us. And so to ignore that will, is, is, is a disaster because we think, I prayed a prayer. I went forward in a church. You know, I signed a card. I was baptized. But then our lives, just, we just live life on our own terms. There's no desire to live for holiness and righteousness. And so Paul is going to make it clear later in this book, and he's also made it clear, crystal clear in Romans that we can't just ignore God and his standard of holiness. The Holy Spirit lives with inside, within us. He's written his laws upon our heart. We talked about this a great deal last week. The Holy Spirit is in us to lead us and guide us into truth. And how can we say that we have salvation and we put our hope and our faith and our confidence in Jesus and then turn around and say, but now I'm going to live life on my terms. I read this this week, and I didn't cite who the author was because I, I, I forgot to do that in my notes but it's a great statement. It says, One sign that many in your congregation are not true believers is how hard you have to motivate them. A group of Christians in name only will have to be manipulated and coerced into acting like followers of Jesus. And that's so true. We, we've seen that. We have relatives and, and friends who go to church like my grandfather every Sunday. But you know, there's no desire to follow Jesus. And any time that a pastor or, or they try to mobilize the congregation to do something good, it has to be guilt-driven, and you have to work and work and work on people. But that's a problem. If the Holy Spirit lives within us, we should be prompted to love other people. And I'm not saying you have to jump on board with everything the church does or everything. We talked a great deal about that. If you didn't get that, go back and listen last week about the Holy Spirit leading us, and we do what the Holy Spirit says. But... The truth is, if you have to be constantly prodded to do the right thing and to do the good things in life, 
And what's wrong? Why, why are you not being compelled by the Spirit? It's like children, you know, who, who just tell you, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And they just do it because they know they have to or because they're going to get in trouble if they don't. But the heart's not there. And God wants our heart. Our actions follow our heart. And that's what Paul wants them to be clear. It's not about a list. It's about your heart changed to move toward Christ. And now in verse 12 through 20, he's going to get real personal here with them. And he's going to make his case. He's going to say, I invested so much in your lives. I came in and I I pastored you. I started these churches. And I loved on you. And I gave all to you. And how could you turn away from the truth that I taught you? Look at verse 12. He says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters. Become like me, for I became like you. You You did me no wrong. So what he's saying there is he's saying, when he moved into their community... And, and, and he became part of them. He lived life with them. He, as Paul said in another place, I became uh, all things to all people so that I might win some. He's saying, you know what? I didn't allow cultural or, or, or these barriers to stand in my way. I just immersed myself right into your culture and lived among you. And I became like you. And he said that, and, and he goes, I want you to come, become like me, meaning the freedom from the law, not thinking that you have to obey these things in order for God to be happy with you. You accepted that at one point. Now why are you turning from that? And so in verse 13, he goes on, he says, As you know, it was because of my illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even through my illness, even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God or if I were Christ Jesus himself. And so Paul is seeming to say that he hadn't originally planned to go to Galatia to start this work. But what? look at the verse, verse 13. But he said, because my illness... I first preached the gospel to you. So you get the picture here? That that wasn't the plan. That was a detour off the path. That he was supposed to go at a different place, but God moved and changed circumstances and even caused illness and suffering in order for these people to be touched by the gospel and their lives to be changed. Well, that brings some really radical, practical truths to us. First, God allows suffering and difficulties in this world into the lives of Christians. He does. He allows suffering and difficulties into our lives. And there's some people who want to tell you, you follow God and it's health and wealth and prosperity and everything's going to be good and great. But you can't ignore passages like this and others that say clearly that that God deviated his plans, deterred his plans so that they could be reached with the gospel. And so God can take the worst of situations and he could take those and use those for his glory and for our good. In the first service, I mentioned about Lynn Zapata, who many of you guys know Lynn, and Lynn just was an incredible, incredible lady. She's part of our K group, and just her insight and her love, and, and, and just uh, many of you just knew her well and were touched by her. And in fact, Greg, her husband, um, is here today with us, and, and just heartbroken. I mean, just somebody that seemed to be in such good health, and something so tragic could happen. And in our heart and our love is definitely with you today, Greg, and, and we just need to rally around him. And the funeral will be on Thursday in Camilla. But we look at situations like this and we think, how could that happen? She, you know, she was so young and in such good health. And we have to know that God has purposes for what he does. And God can take the most tragic of situations and he can turn those for his glory for people to come to Christ. And, and Greg, you know this as well as all of us, that Lynn is not sad. I mean, she is the best she's ever been in her life at this moment. I mean, she is, she's an incredible place before God, and, and, and we're the ones that should feel sorry for ourselves because, one, we, we're not with her, and then we miss her. But we understand that God can take these situations. And how many funerals and memorial services have we been at where we've seen people come in droves to Christ as a result of a death or a tragedy? And, and I dare say, even in your own life, if you think about the things that drew you close to God, they were probably connected to a tragic event or a difficult circumstance you went through. Because we have a tendency, when we have it figured out and life's going smooth, to have very little dependence upon Jesus and to trust ourselves. And so that brings us to our, uh, the second thing. God changes even our well-thought-out plans in order to bring about a greater good, even through suffering. God is bringing about a greater good, even though we have it all scripted out, 
planned out. And some of you are, I'm not so much the big planner. I mean, that's just not naturally my personality. But some of you are very much, you know, you've got to have it all figured out. And that's good. I mean, we, planning is important. It's essential. It's critical. But you know what's also critical? That we don't hold too tightly to those plans and those dreams. Because God can say, you know what? It's going smooth for you, right? Very little dependence on me. Let me detour you off here for a second. And let me show you what I'm going to do. All right? It's good that you had your plans, but you know what? That's not the way it's going to turn out. I've got other plans. I've got other dreams. And here's the thing. When we see that God's in control, we see we're not the star of the show. The story's not about us. It's not our name up on the billboard. It's not our name in lights. It's God's name in lights. And he's the one that gets the glory. And it works for our good as Christians. That's what the amazing thing is. He takes even the worst of situations and he can turn those for our good. And I know it doesn't feel like it, and I'm not trying to downplay anybody's suffering or pain, especially yours, Greg, but the truth is, life is, is full of suffering and pain. And we live in a broken world, and all of us are going to be one day at the front of a room or in a casket. Bad things happen. Terrible things happen. Tragedy comes our way. But we trust that, God, it's about you. It's about your purposes. You're the star. It's your story. You know, I always hated it in school when I'd write a paper. I thought I was a pretty good writer, and I'd write a paper, type it up, turn it into the teacher, and then she'd hand it back, and there'd be red marks all over that paper. Lines drawn, run-on sentences, all kinds of issues. Pretty much have to rewrite the whole thing. And that's how some of you feel like, you know, you've got your, your life written out, scripted out. And you think it's, it's the exact way it should be. And God comes along and says, not so fast. Hold on a second. Embrace what God's doing. Allow yourself to detour from your plans. Paul says, I'm with you. I came to you because of my illness. It wasn't his plan. So much we can learn from that. And then verse 15, he says, Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so back when he was with them, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Just the love they had for him and just the incredible just fellowship and bond they had. And he says, Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? He says, verse 17, Those people, he's talking about the Judaizers, the false teachers, They're zealous to win you over, but to no good. What they want is to alienate you from me so that you may have zeal for them. And so we see that whenever people abandon God's word, they abandon sound teaching, there's going to be divisions because that's a symptom of sin. And and, and, and people's egos get in the way. And these Judaizers, they want want followers. They They want to be central. They want to be the ones who have the fans. And how guilty is our culture of that? In a day where, you know, media and internet and, and, and TV and, and pastors and, and you get so many people who are put up on pedestals, maybe not even by their own choosing, but by other people treating them and, te- and treating them like they're so important and they follow those people at the expense of following Christ. And that's what the Judaizers want to see happen. They want the people to follow them. They say, don't follow Paul. Don't look at Paul. Follow us. Follow us. And and these intentions were out of jealousy. They didn't want the Christians to be loyal to Paul. They didn't want the freedom that he was teaching. They wanted to bring them back into control. Do things the way that we think you should do them. And he says, it's fine, verse 18, to be zealous. Being zealous is a good thing. That makes sure your, your zeal is put to the right spot. It's on the right things. Not just falling blindly after these false teachers. And then verse 19, Paul says what his motive is. He says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Look what he's saying there. He's saying, I want to see Jesus formed in you. I want to see you grow to be more like Jesus. And that should be every teacher, every pastor, every leader in this church's heart's desire is to see people have Christ formed in them. 
and how easy it is for anybody in leadership to care more about you and your ego and your following versus the fact that Christ needs to be formed in them. And Paul had it right. Paul understood that it was about them becoming more like Jesus, not them becoming more fans of these Judaizers or fans of Paul or Paulus, as he said other places, but fans of Jesus Christ. And so are you a fan of Jesus? I was talking to a guy the other day, and he said, you know, just until a, a few years ago, I just had a hard time saying Jesus. He, sa- he said, I could say God and talk real general, but I just, for some reason, I just had a hard time just saying the name Jesus. And I bet Satan's looking at that and like, I love that. Because you know what? The more we can downplay Jesus, the better off the kingdom of darkness is. Because the truth is, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. And so we got to lift Jesus up. We gotta, our desire has to be see Jesus formed in our kids. Not just so we have good moral kids who don't drink and they don't smoke and they don't hang around bad people. I mean, so many times, that's what we exalt as, like, that's my goal. And, man, if I get my kid out of high school and, you know, they haven't got kicked out of school or suspended, they haven't gotten anybody pregnant or gotten pregnant, and, you know, and, and they pretty much are, live a, a fairly decent moral life, I've done well. You know, that's a dangerous goal because you're teaching them it's all about behavior modification and it's all about just adapting and looking good on the outside. There's no true heart for God. I was talking to, uh, to a, a young man, probably 15 or 16 or 17 years old the other day, and he said, I was really pushing it. I was like, hey, man, come on, tell me about your faith. Is it real? He's like, I'm going to be honest, man. Just, you know, when I get out of, out of the house, I'm just going to live life the way I want to live it. And I was like, talk to me about that, man. Why, why would you want to do that? And he's like, I'm just tired of, like, Christianity being pushed down my throat. And he's like, it's all, it's all, you know, it's all these rules and stuff. And, and, and it's like, you really need to think about it. And this other guy I was sitting with, he said, you know, I lived that life. He goes, God had to bring me to a breaking point where I understood, you know what, that leads to disaster. Our hope has to be in Christ. And I hope some way, shape, or form got this kid's attention because that's what our, all our hearts should break. But when we see someone who especially is raised in a Christian home who says, can't wait, can't wait to get away. And as parents, we got to ask ourselves, Why? I mean, I understand kids make their, ulti- they make their choices ultimately. But we've got to do everything we can to speak to their hearts, to get inside their hearts and help them to see the glorious nature of Jesus. And if we're not speaking in the name of Jesus in our house, do you think they're seeing how glorious Jesus is? Absolutely not. We've got to, as dads and moms, we've got to take the leadership, step up and say, I'm going to talk to my kids about Christ. I'm going to speak the name of Jesus often, a lot more than I speak of NCAA basketball tournament or speak of my favorite person on TV or this favorite singer. Jesus is going to be the central name that's spoken in our house. And Paul says, I hurt like the pains of childbirth. And then verse 20 says, How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. And Paul's saying, you know what? It's hard for me to be so honest with you. I wish I could be there with you and show the love, but you know what? It's sometimes it's hard when we're speaking, writing to, to show our hearts, kind of like an email you type out and your heart's not really shown in what you're saying. And Paul's saying, I wish I could be with you there so you could see my heart, but I've got to speak the truth to you because the gospel frees me to be able to do that because I care about you. And the truth is what you need to hear, not just what makes you feel good or what seems to be the best for you, but I'm giving you what is the best for you. And what a great thing for all of us as parents, husbands and wives, leaders in the church. We can't love a person so selfishly that we can't risk their anger and tell them the truth. There's times when, you know, we have to do that to our kids. That's hard, isn't it? You know, that's not going to happen, or this is the way it's going to be. And, they, you know, oh, I don't like it because, you know, they're giving me the cold shoulder. Or, you know, they, they, they're, they're treating me weird or they're not going to be my friend or it's going to drive them away. I can assure you the best thing for them is to speak the truth in love. As Scripture says, speak the truth in love and guide their hearts to Jesus. A Jesus-centered ministry, as Paul had a Jesus-centered approach, 
is marked by loving honesty, the word, the truth, not spin, not image, not flattery. And that's exactly why we preach scripture. If you're newer here, you haven't been here in a while, we're going through the book of Galatians. We're in week nine, and we're just going through it. Why? Because just selling an image or a package or a a feel-good message here to you is not going to change your life ultimately. It's God's word in you. And the Holy Spirit takes that word, if you're truly a believer, and he makes it real and active and alive. And he brings you to choices of holiness and choices of following Christ, even if there is a cost. Does it mean perfection? Clearly not. Clearly not. But it does mean there is a movement in your life and your heart to be more like Christ. And so, to kind of summarize today what Paul talked about, he said, religiosity, being religious without a personal relationship with Jesus is more deceptive than worshiping idols. We've got to put our trust and our confidence in Christ alone. And so if you and your family or you and your spouse find yourself today being very religious, being very moral, but no real relationship with Jesus, what do you do? You say, God, I want to put my trust fully in Christ. I want to put my confidence in Christ. I want to transfer my trust away from what I think is my wisdom, my knowledge, my understanding. I'm going to put it into Jesus Christ, on Jesus Christ. Put my hope on him. And I'm going to do that consistently. All the time. Like I talked about last week, real prayers, authentic prayers, not just the same little packaged prayer that we say before the meal, but understanding that that we need to speak to our Heavenly Father and talk to our Father because of Jesus Christ. He said we can come boldly before him. And then the second thing, as I alluded to earlier, life is God's story, not ours. And we have to release our grip daily on our attempts to control life and say, here's where it's going. Ten-year plan right here. Better not deviate from that. Let's stick to it. And God says, 10-year plan, two months in, you're going to hold a different direction. And God says, I'm going to keep you on your knees, humble, because your plans and your dreams rarely ever happen the way that you think they're going to happen. He wants to increase our trust in him. And he wants us to remove ourselves from trying to be the king of life and these little itty-bitty stories that we think are so important in our life and see that God's writing a much, much bigger story. And we're the supporting cast. And we lift him up and share him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that speaks life and truth to us. God, we thank you for your holiness that is revealed in the law that shows us that we can never, ever save ourselves. And even if we happen to just seem to get it right just for a few straight hours, there's so many sins that we don't even see in our motives and our our agendas and our egos. And the law points and shows us that we have fallen way short of you and your glory. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his righteousness that's given to us on our behalf. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that now leads and guides us, not just to obey a list, but to to really be moved to righteousness and holiness and moved to love others in a sacrificial, meaningful way. And God, we pray for our church that you might continue to guide us and move us and lead us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.